So by 1994, and it was later confirmed to us later in 94 and 95, then when R Rockefeller hosted the Clintons, and there's that famous picture of Hillary Clinton holding um, the book about extraterrestrial intelligence um, at the Rockefeller Ranch when they were visiting out there. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Okay, so she actually is the one who stood up and stopped the briefing uh, and said it's too dangerous. We don't want. We're not going to pursue this. Um, and. Ultimately, politicians are going to put their finger in the air and they're going to see which way the winds are blowing and see what they can benefit from. They saw this as a lose-lose situation. In other words, it was a situation where if they were to push on this, they would be stepping on some very big toes. Very, very big toes. How big? Several hundred trillion dollars of world economic activity. Now let me, let me back this up now. So the how is hard for some people to wrap their mind around when it comes to this kind of secrecy, but the why is, 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 the, is the pièce de résistance. Because if you look at what these projects that are unacknowledged special access projects are doing, what they really have been doing has been tr a, a trying to acquire as this top secret Canadian document, the Wilbur Smith document in 1951 states, the modus operandi, the mechanism of action of these extraterrestrial vehicles, meaning the technology, the science and technology. Because if you're interstellar, you're not using Exxon Jet A fuel. You're not using uh, a rocket like SpaceX and Virgin Galactic is using. You're not using something like the space shuttle. Um, you're using some technologies that are the trans-dimensional end of physics, very high energy electromagnetic field propulsion systems that allow you to drop out of 3D space and appear at another point in space by going through other dimensions. Okay. Um, now, you can do that without going trans-dimensional by just creating energy from the so-called zero-point field and creating an anti-gravity effect so you have lifters so that you can go 100,000 miles per hour and make a right-hand turn with no deceleration effect because you created a bubble in space-time that corrects for one gravity. That's what a lot of the, quote, UFOs are that people see being test flown out near Nellis and the Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah and et cetera and so on. We mastered gravity control October 1954. I was not a twinkle in my father's eye. <laughs> Most of you weren't born at that point. I wasn't. And that is when we mastered gravity control. How do I know this? The third highest ranking official at the Naval Research Labs, the largest defense lab uh, for the Department of Defense, here in Washington is, has been a friend for years and he was in the vault and saw the documentation for this unredacted because it's all the original documents and that was the date. So we have not needed jet engines, rockets, oil, gas, public utilities, surface roads, think about this, steamships, internal combustion engines of any sort for at least 60 years. And if you really go back to the early, earlier part of the century, we're just playing free energy from Tesla type things, 100 years. But you're stepping on a stockpile of money and commodities and mineral wealth being traded, oil, coal, other uranium, that's worth in the aggregate several hundred trillion dollars. The US federal budget is three or four trillion. And if you take out entitlements and things that are mandatory, it's, it's a fraction of that. So, you're, you know, it's the tail is wagging the dog here. So the financial interest, the petrodollar interest, the big commodity trading firms like Goldman Sachs, and the big money folks, that's where the action is. And those are the masters not the President, not the Congress, not the UN Secretary General, certainly, not the Prime Minister of England, et cetera. So let's just like pull the mask off and just admit that we're living in a period of petro-oligarchs 
kleptocrats, klepto meaning theft, like a kleptomaniac, kleptocrats, and that this sort of myth of free markets and a free society and an open and free democracy is just a myth. Because our democracy was hijacked decades ago. Now, on trivial issues like the marginal tax rate or whether you're going to raise or lower payments for Social Security, the President and Congress can fight about that and it's sort of this, this show going on, a whirling dervish show of, of nonsense that goes on. On these issues, they don't want those clowns, is how they view it, dealing with it. So this permanent, unacknowledged, covert program has put a lead ceiling in. And only rarely does anything bubble up from there, or down, I should say, to the body politic out of these unacknowledged special access projects. So it became my task to find out how to do that and live to see the next day, all right? Because it doesn't do me any good if I do it recklessly and I'm dead. You can't do anything if you're dead. Well, you can, but it's, you know, different. So <laughs> you're doing other things. So this became, be, became the really the central issue. Um, and Lawrence Rockefeller, I suggested, look, we need to then, if the president will not do this, we need to get together a group of people put together this best available evidence, and also assemble top secret folks who will have the courage to provide credible documentation, testimony about what they've known. So I suggested and organized a meeting at a Silomar uh, facility in, near Monterey, California in June of 1995. Uh, Edgar Mitchell was there with me, uh, uh, Marina Popovich, who was a very renowned cosmonaut in the Soviet Union, some KGB officers were there, and some of the early um, uh, Disclosure Project witnesses were there. Now this is 95, this is 20 years ago. And um, Lawrence paid for it, um, and, um, and, and Lawrence Rockefeller said, look, you know, I will totally support doing this. Um, and when I was with him at the ranch, I said, well, why don't you take a, lead, a public leadership in this? You're, you're, and it, I was talking to him out on his, his, his deck at the, with the beautiful Remington Native American sculpture, that's, you know, with the, the Native American on horseback, you know, the very famous, of course, they have the original of everything. Um, and I said, I really, I need your help. He says, oh no, it's too dangerous for me. He says, there are members of my family already jumping up and down on my feet that I'm doing this much. And I knew he was talking about who the, he was talking about, the money people in his family. He was the philanthropist, philanthropic guy who just wanted to give away his wealth before he died. That was his whole purpose. Really sweet man. And so I said, well, okay, you know, I told him you're old, you're rich, and you're a Rockefeller. I'm, no, I'm a nobody. I'm a North Carolina doctor who's trying to do this with no resources. He says, J just, well, I'll be behind the scenes. And he took his old hands and did this, and he said, it's like a flock of geese. You know, we're all flying together. I'll be back here, and you need to be here. I said, well, yeah, but that head goose gets all the head. They take turns. He said, no, no, you be up here. It was very comical. I said, oh, oy vey. This is like, Phew. I said, okay, that's what we'll do then. Um, and he, he wanted to just stay behind the scenes, but he was provide that support, hosted the Clintons. So we had something called Project Starlight that formed before the briefing of the CIA director. That was the code name for what became the Disclosure Project that all of you know about. And Project Starlight, if you were the AP, the Associated Press sued the Clinton Library and got those documents. Those documents are in my first book. And at Asilomar, we had all these dignitaries, including uh, Kevin Foley and astronaut Edgar Mitchell and Maureen Povovich and all these folks sign a letter to the President of the United States recommending ending the secrecy. It's in my first book. Buy it, get it, see it, read it. And that, however, was the, the Associated Press a couple years ago sued the Clinton Library and got those documents and they put them out on the internet. Now, 
at this point, we knew by 95, the president, with all the cajoling we could do, with all the work Lawrence was doing behind the scene, hosting Bill and Hillary at the JY Ranch for their vacations, um, a very good friend of the president's, uh, I don't want to name her, but used to live at the White House and very good friends with, with Hillary, you know, said that uh, Hillary did not want to deal with this at all, but Bill was so interested in it, you know, he would, he would uh, pull out the best available evidence briefing packet that we put together and we'd be sitting in the private quarters of the White House going through it and she was, she's this hilarious woman who did a perfect imitation of Bill Clinton and he, he said one time they, they put it out on the floor and she was sitting there with him and he was going through it going, well I know all this is true but they won't tell me a thing, not a goddamn thing. <laughs> Just like that, about all these secret programs. So, <laughs> when she told me that, I said, it sounds like Mr. Clinton. So, um, both, it, from 95 until 98, I proceeded then to approach various members of Congress. And we had already started that process thinking, well, okay, if the president won't do an executive action and force his way to control these unacknowledged special access projects, maybe a member of Congress will have the courage to hold a hearing, and since we now have identified, first it was about a dozen, and then it became several dozen top secret guys that could be subpoenaed and swear under oath with penalties of perjury, federal penalties of perjury, if you're testifying before Congress, go ask some folks who are in prison for lying to Congress, uh, about what they knew. And so I started assembling these folks the first meeting of which was in June of 1995. I'd met with a, a number of them one-on-one, -on -one, but there's strength in numbers. So I realized that if we came together as a group and they got to know each other and they felt that it was, um, they felt safer, they felt protected if they were all doing it together. You see what I mean? Brilliant. Okay, so that was what I did, is pull people together. Because these men and, and some of the women involved were terrified about speaking about this on their own as lone wolves. But I said, let's get a mass of us together and do it. So that first gathering was very historic because it, it was sort of uh, presaged what we did in 2001. Now at that point, you know, I decided, look, we are going to have to be very careful with this. So I wanted to be sure that not only did the president have no access, which is in itself proof of the illegality of these unacknowledged special access projects, but that the appropriate oversight committees of the Congress of the United States didn't, as well as key people at the Pentagon. So I proceeded then to do a series of briefings. And in 1997, here in Georgetown at the Westin Hotel, we gathered together, I think, about uh, 20, 25 of these top secret guys in a closed meeting, not open to the public, to invite members of Congress, uh, members of the administration, and people from the Pentagon to hear their, what they knew. And it was a very well-organized, private event. No media was there, and the public didn't know about it, uh, except in a very limited way. And the idea was that we wanted to get a member of Congress, and like Congressman Dan Burton, who was chairman of the House Government Oversight Committee, Reform and Oversight Committee, that issued a thousand subpoenas to impeach Clinton about the stain on the blue dress, was there. And he was interested because one of his closest friends, who kept his appointment schedule, had had a UFO come outside her window in, in, in uh, Indiana some years ago and told him about it. So he knew the UFOs were real. And he, he turned to us and he says, I want everything you have, everything you have. And then someone got to him and he didn't hold the hearings. But there were many members of Congress and other people. There were people from the Vice President Al Gore's office there. There were people from the White House. There were people from the Pentagon. The day after that event, I went straight to the Pentagon and did a briefing, what's called a stand-up briefing, for uh, J2, the head of intelligence for Joint Chiefs, a different one from the one who forced the meeting at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, 
And this uh, Admiral Tom Wilson uh, hosted us at the Pentagon in the E-ring, you know, where all the admirals and generals are, the outer ring, because they get the views. So the inner ring can't see anything. Um, and I went there with astronaut Edgar Mitchell, uh, myself, a couple of the uh, Disclosure Project witnesses, and my assistant, Sherry Adamat. And what was fascinating is that before I went, I had my military advisor send to the Admiral a document I had received. And it's the first top secret document in the briefing for the President uh, that I did for Obama, which we'll get to in a little bit. And in this, this is dated from the 90s, and it's from Nellis Air Force Base, what people call mistakenly Area 51. It's not the proper name. And this document actually was a security alert because there were some UFO spotters who had penetrated the perimeter <laughs> of Nellis and they were going to have to shut down operations with their EMGs, their electromagnetogravitic anti-gravity test flights in that range that they have built. And it lists, the list is fascinating for the names of the compartments. And I just want to share a few of them just because, uh, and this is a dated uh, 28 July 1991, 0900 hours, and it's from the N National Reconnaissance Office, NRO, which is the super secret spy satellite operations part of the Air Force originally. Uh, so it went to Commander's Net, Royal Ops, Cosmic Ops, that is a clearance. These are all compartmented operations. MAJ, M-A-J, Ops, MAGI Ops, COMINT, COMSEC, ELINT, HUMANT, Human Intelligence Ops, AFOSI, Nellis, Air Force Office of Special Investigations, and then a whole bunch of different numbered compartments. Red Flag, Dart East, Dart South, Pahut Mesa Military Operating Center, Sally Carter, key one, Groom Lake, MOC, Dreamland, MOC, Blackjack Team, Blackjack Control is at Edwards, by the way. The control is at Edwards, but there was a team at, uh, at Nellis. Uh, Aquatech, Sea Spray, et cetera. So one of these compartments was known by Admiral Tom Wilson. I don't know which one. But it was being operated through a contractor. All the important stuff is done by corporate, by the way. If it's key, it's corporate. Um, Lockheed Martin, EG&G, E-Systems, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Booz Allen Hamilton, on and on. Edward Snowden, by the way, work for Booz Allen Hamilton, who contracts for the National Security Agency. So the corporate world is actually where most of the USAPs get centered. And then they interface with these USAPs within military and intelligence, like this. And if you approach it from the government, they say, well, it's, you know, it doesn't exist. And you approach it from a corporate, it's privatized. It's a corporate secret, like Microsoft's code. Got it? It's hermetically sealed away from everyone between those two techniques. Very clever. Very illegal, very clever. Um, but the mafia is always very clever. Um, and this is the biggest mafia in the world. So um, when Tom Wilson, when Admiral Wilson recognized one of these compartments, he contacted them. Now this is prior to me and Edgar Mitchell and other people arriving at the Pentagon in the spring of 1997. And he picked up the phone and he said, uh, this is uh, Admiral Wilson, I'm uh, Head of Intelligence Joint Staff, J2, I'd like to be read into, which means briefed, I want to be read into this project, blah. And they say, yes sir, we know who you are, but uh, you don't have a need to know. And he said, God damn it, I'm the Head of Intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, how can I not have a need to know? And they said, sir, we cannot discuss this with you, and we will not. Click hung up on him, blocked his line, would not receive any further calls from, this is an admiral in charge of intelligence assessments and putting intelligence together for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Pentagon of the United States. 
Now this I know for a personal fact. So, so now you have a coup d'etat that extends to the, even the highest levels of the Pentagon. So by the time I walk through the door to do what was supposed to be a 45 minute stand up briefing for the Admiral and his staff, he was so scared and so mad, he was scared. And the meeting went for two hours, and if Edgar Mitchell hadn't had to leave to go to an interview in New York City on some TV show, it would have gone on for three or four hours. He kept canceling his other appointments. At the end of that briefing, I said, we really need your help. And he said, well, what can I do? They're not going to tell me anything. The best thing I have in my arsenal is the B-2 stealth bomber that I know about. And you're telling me that there are unacknowledged projects that have things that can go trans-dimensional light speed and beyond, that can do circles around my B-2 stealth. He says, it's point, set, and match. I said, well, you still need to help us get control. He says, how can I do that without having the Secretary of Defense or the President order me to without myself doing something rogue? See, so here's the good guys are trapped by being good. I said, the only thing, here's the thing, the only thing bad about nice people is that they're nice. And the people who are rapacious criminals are not nice and they don't give a damn about the law or people's lives and they don't mind killing you. So he said, I can't do this. And then he said, well, who else have you met with? I said, well, the CIA director, and the, I started naming all these people. So he says, well, you know, if those folks are being schmidt canned, pushed aside, what am I supposed to do? So he basically threw up his hands. He says, I don't see that I can do anything. 